All right, welcome into this week's episode with a special guest, Mike Liu from Bunk Bed Breakdowns. Welcome to the show. Hey man, how's it going? Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm uh, you know from Bunk Bed Breakdowns, also BDG. If you guys follow BDG Fantasy, uh, happy to be on the show. Uh, you know, we, you and I actually met in person um, at uh, at the last uh, Fantasy Football Expo. So, uh, and then we we've, we've interacted with Twitter and, and DMs. I know you like reached out to me when you guys first started as well. So I remember you from back then as well. So it's, it's cool to uh, you know sync up here. I'm um, happy to be on the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. Super excited to have you on the show. You were the first person that I reached out to in the space. Um, and so you encouraged me to, you know, start a show, start making videos, uh, encourage me to keep trying. And, um, you know, for, for people who are watching the show or listening to the podcast, uh, if you're looking to create content, really recommend just trying your hand at it and you never know where it's going to end up going. Um, Absolutely. Mike, when, when did you start in this space? Uh, when, when did I start? I was few years ago i guess i mean it always feels like a lot so long ago but i've done i guess i've recorded a bunch of episodes now so it's been uh over two years maybe even close to three i know i just started on like twitter just randomly you know shooting the shit with people like talking to ray and garrett price who you know who are all both like you know very high up in the industry now when i was like a nobody um and then i started writing for dynasty nerds and as a writer i started evolving and then uh, my good friend, Nick, uh, Nick or Colano from BDG he was like, Hey, like you should come on and do the dynasty show for me. Um, and we were already friends before then I had met him and we were friends through YouTube. I was like a follower and fan of the show early on. And, um, we kind of kept it that way. So ever since then, I've just been making pumping out videos. You know, I, I have my show, which is, which is market watch Monday. That's like my main show. Um, but yeah, it's been, it's been, it's been good time. It's been fun. I've evolved, you know, I've learned, I've made plenty of mistakes and uh, it's just been it's just been a pretty interesting journey like you like you said man i just p- literally picked up a microphone and and started and started recording you know i didn't really i'm not you know didn't really have like mass lots of practice or anything like that i just you know just hopped on the mic and i'm sure i was awful in the beginning uh, and i'm <laughs> sure i'm still not even that good now but i've gotten a lot better and it just, honestly just comes with practice i guess Yeah, man, looking back at the first videos I made in like November 2020 to now, even like it's kind of cringe, but it's really (laughs) cool to see the the progress that you make. Yeah, Um, for sure. You know, Mike, uh, what sort of content do you make, you know, for people who aren't familiar with, you know, the space that you come from? Yeah, so uh, my background is, I mean, I'm a degenerate at heart, (laughs) um, but my, my professional background is in finance. So, you know, I've worked in finance my whole life. Um, you know, from accounting to investment banking to, you know, operation side at, at startups, I've, I've kind of done the whole shebang and, you know, I work at startups now in a finance capacity. So that's always a mindset that I bring. Like I'm a very analytical type of guy. Um, and when it comes to player breakdowns and stuff like that, I feel like the, the content is so saturated with that already. Uh, and like, it's not like I'm going to break down someone better than, than Ray GQ who does it really well. I'm not going to break down someone you know, analytically better than like a Peter Howard or a Drew, you know, DFB encounter. I think, you know, all, all good friends of mine. Um, but I think with the, the, the edge that I bring to the game is I focus very much on just like high level strategy concepts. So all my videos, you'll very rarely see me break down players. Uh, cause like I said, one, it's not that interesting to me, but two, that's not my forte, but I am, what I am good at is kind of analyzing trends uh, understanding the market and just playing game theory within my, within my leagues. And I think honestly, like that's a very, very underserved part of the market. Like you go on Twitter, you go on YouTube, you go on wherever, like 90, 99% of the videos are like players you should buy players. You should sell, you know, who you should draft, who's undervalued, who's overvalued. And it's just a completely saturated market. I think everyone's talking about the same shit. Um, I think <laughs> an under, very underserved part of the market is a strategy component because you can be the greatest player valued ever. Um, but if you were to give me someone who's really good at strategy, they knew nothing about football and, and all they knew was like ADPs and, and values and general market trends versus someone that knew nothing about any of that, didn't know any game theory, didn't know anything about market trends and just really knew how to study players. I would take the, the guy that understands market trends and knows nothing about football, like 10 times out of 10, because it, the game is, the game comes down to numbers, right? All you're doing is all you're trying to do every year is to try and acquire the most points uh, for the least around for the least amount of value that loses the least amount of value going forward in dynasty. So, you know, that's kind of all, what all of my content is built around. Like I try and 
I try and like teach people a way to think and I don't want people to just agree with me. Right. But I want to teach them a way to think about the game. That's different than, you know, the way most people think about the game. And hopefully they can take those types of learning, apply to their own players. And, you know, just because we don't agree on the same player doesn't mean anything because if they can take the strategies and apply that and kind of dominate their leagues, that's really what a lot of my content is built around. It's mostly all strategy based and, and it's very rarely, you know, player focused. Yeah, I think one of my favorite tidbits that you shared uh, is how to attack uh, rookie drafts. You know, mm. while everyone was saying, you know, for the 2022 class, oh, I saw your picks, go for the 2023 class. You were saying, hey, man, sit back and profit. You know, like if you mm. have 2022 picks uh, or if you can go and get them at a discount, they're always cheaper in season. And then right when the off season hits, you know, that's when you go and you actually go and make your money because you can literally just hold those assets and then you wait three months and all of a sudden those values appreciate by 30, 40 percent. Yeah. I mean, look what happens. Go. Brees Hall goes out there, runs a sub four four. Uh, you know, Garrett Wilson goes out there, runs a sub four four. You know, Olave goes out there, runs a four two. You know, Isamira White goes out there, runs a bunch of running backs going out there, measuring a 220, you know, running four fours. And all of a sudden, this class doesn't suck as bad as everyone thought it did. Uh, and it never does. You know, it just never does. And it's just, that's just like one of the easiest ways to profit. Because I'm like, you know, everyone, if everyone's going for something, I mean, that usually means that you probably shouldn't be going for that thing. So everyone was going for 2023 picks. And I love 2023 picks, but I got all my 2023 picks like two years ago. Uh, because that was the point where I'm like, okay, this is when they're cheapest. And so I'm not trading for 2023 picks anymore because in order to get a 2023 pick, you're basically paying fully realized value at this point. Uh, because of how imbalanced they are in the in the eyes of the market relative to the 2022 class so i was like all right well i'm just gonna grab some more 2022 picks and see what happens uh and you know like i said man like rookie picks all they do is just increase in value from in season to now every single year never changes the only thing that changes is maybe they increase a little bit less than years past but that's still fine um and it's just been uh and i'm excited now to start kind of hitting some of these rookie drafts because the class is a little bit deeper now than I thought it would be. It's still not as top heavy, right? It's you're not going to get the same. You don't have a Jonathan Taylor out there. You don't have like a DeAndre Swift out there, but you do have a bunch of very good players, a bunch of very good wide receivers and running backs. You can kind of pick at the top of the class. Yeah, they always say when they zig, you should zag. You know, anytime the yeah. market's going in one direction, go the complete opposite direction, you know, w at least within reason. Um, yeah. Because everything's going to be overpriced otherwise, you know, if you're yeah. going where everybody wants to buy. Um, I think it's really cool that, you know, your entire, you know, methodology is to teach people how to think about the game. And one of the things that I've been waiting to kind of pick your brain about is, you know, you do come from this analytical background, you know, you probably entered the space looking at numbers and probably being very captivated by how you can understand the game through numbers. But I remember seeing last season, uh, last off season, Jalen Waddle didn't meet any of those numbers for you, uh, or at least wasn't like, you know, on the same uh, level as Jamar Chase, but mm -hmm. you fell in love with his film. So mm -hmm. I'm super curious to understand like what extra dimensions of watching film kind of changed your mind or overrode what the numbers were telling you when analyzing that player. Yeah. Well, uh, first off, I don't say like, I'm not like a film guy at all. Like, I mean, I just watch football cause I, I like it. Um, so I, I want, I wouldn't say like I, I took on like a film, uh, film prowess all of a sudden in the off season. Uh, what I will say is I've kind of evolved over the past couple of years. Like, like you said, when I first started, much like every single other analytics analyst, like I thought I was hot shit. I was like, oh, all I need is numbers. I don't need film. Like, you know, film guys are, are they suck. Like they always miss. And, you know, that's true to a degree to, for a certain subset of the film community. But I think what I learned is I really came to value like the skill set that film people bring and I really leveraged them. So, you know, some of my famous favorite film follows Raging Q, I mentioned him. Uh, Jared Wackley, Garrett Price, guys over at Dynasty Nerds, big fan of them. Jetpack Galileo, one of my favorite film guys, because he takes his film and he puts it into numbers and he grades it. And that's why I like the nerds as well. Nerds kind of did that last year. And I think that takes a lot of guts for them to put on paper like and put a stamp on someone before the draft happens. Like, hey, this is what the film tells me. And so I'm a big fan of following them. So in, in my entire career, like I want, I want to say career, it's not like I'm making a living out of this, out of this, but um, in my entire time of playing fantasy, my, the biggest, the best hits are always, always when the numbers align with the film. And in my early days, I used to always 
forget about the film. And I thought I was better than the film. And as I grew, I learned more and more. Uh, Angelo Fantasy actually is another really good guy. And I, I'm constantly barraging these guys in my DMs. And I'm asking them, like, hey, what do you think about these players? What do you think about these players? Like, I, I, I like this guy from a film, from an analyst perspective. What, do the, what does the film tell me? And sometimes they'll disagree with me. And if they do, I used to write them off. But now I'm like, okay, well, let me think about, like, you know, why is it they don't like him? Like, is there some holes in my, in my strategy? And when it came to Jalen Waddle, actually, he was a very interesting test case because I could build a numbers case around him, and I did. And it's not like he had no analytics, right? If we right. think back to what Jalen Waddle was, he, ha- he had holes, but he had a lot of bright spots. As a true freshman, he was the best performing, uh, one of the best performing wide receivers on the team, not named uh, Jerry Judy, right? Mm-hmm. So, so he outperformed both Devonta Smith and... Henry Ruggs, who were both sophomores compared to him when he was a, when he was a freshman, right? So that was one really good selling point. And then he had a really abysmal sophomore year, right? So there's no excuse for that. And I said that right out the gate. I said, look, there's no way for me to explain this. This is why I could never put him on the same field as Jamar Chase um, or even Rashad Bateman, who I really liked coming out of that class. But if we look at what he did in his junior year, he like absolutely dominated in the games that he was healthy. And then we, he like, you know, he, he like, broke his ankle or, or hurt his ankle and then obviously it went downfield but up until that point he was out producing devonta smith on a market share of yards perspective he was out producing devonta smith in, in a lot of in a lot, a lot of various aspects into including a yard for a team bass attempt so um there was a lot of good things to like about him and then when i talked to the film guys and when i watched the film i'm like yo this guy this guy can ball like when you watch him <laughs> he will break a game and he's not your I, I hate the typical just long speed sprinters. I was never a fan of Henry Ruggs. Like at no point right. was I like, hey, let, let's create a story for Henry Ruggs. I'm like, there's no story to make. This guy's just not very good. But uh, I hated people comparing him to Henry Ruggs because it showed how shallow that analysis was because they were nowhere clear to the same player. Even to me as a novice film guy, Jill and Waddle had way more twitch and short area speed, way more agility than Henry Ruggs. You could use him in certain ways. You can never use Henry Ruggs. Henry Ruggs was really just top speed guy. But Jalen Waddle, as we see in the NFL, how could he hog, hog so many targets? Is because you can use them so effectively in the short area. So uh, it just really became a, a case where I was like, all right, well, my eyes tell me he's good. The numbers, you've got to squint a little bit, but the numbers tell you he can be really good. Now he can be a really low floor, but he can also be a really high ceiling, which turned out to be. And then when I talked to the really good film guys like Jetpack Galileo, like uh angelo fantasy like you know the guys and nerds they all told me like yo this guy's bomb and jetpack got a little when i talked to him he's like yo i love waddle too he might be like he might be like wide receiver one in the class i'm like all right well let's not fuck around because it's Jamar Chase, <laughs> but i'm willing to i'm willing to entertain the idea that he's up there and if you'll if you'll remember the best analytics person of all time in my opinion uh jj zacharyson I had him on the pod and I was like, Hey, look, am I crazy for liking Jalen Waddle a lot? And he's like, no, like I, my model likes Jalen Waddle too. Cause if you remember, like a lot of us, Ray Q called this. So shout out to him, the King. Uh, he said, Jalen Waddle is going off the board first off the board. Like, you know, a long time ago. Right. Uh, and you know, obviously, you know, he went really early. He couldn't beat out Jamar Chase cause Jamar Chase is a God, but you know, he went really, really early in the draft. So all, all those factors combined, if you zoomed out a little bit and took in everything, which is what I think, people lack the ability to do a lot of people lack the ability to do like you know the 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 extreme analytics in my opinion is like just as bad as the extreme film guys because right. ne- neither side is willing to learn or come to any sort of agreement so i hate that um like I, when i get in debates with analyst guys like sometimes it's just as painful as when i get into debates with film film bros um but for me it's like i like taking that balanced approach i know where i'm weak so i lean on people that are stronger than me that are smarter than me uh, in those aspects of the field and jill and waddle is just a great example where hey if you zoom out a bit right and you and you take everything in context of what he was able to do and what his number showed out at he actually was a very very good prospect i think that there's really strong signals in understanding like what the wisdom of the crowds are telling you you mm-hmm. know if like the analytics community loves a player but the film guys hate him or vice versa uh, that player is someone you should be double clicking on and you definitely shouldn't write off. Yeah. Um, I, I think that, you know, it, when we're transitioning over to the 2022 class, there are a couple of guys that fit, you know, that mold where one community really likes them. Another community really doesn't. Isaiah Spiller comes to mind. Uh, Garrett Wilson sometimes comes to mind. Uh, some people have even brought up like uh, George Pickens to me. Um, I'm curious, you know, are there any Jalen Waddle type prospects that really like pique your interest in this class? I don't think there's any like jail and I mean, I guess the, the natural guy that lazy people are going to fall on is Jameson Williams. He piqued right. my interest for sure because he was a non-factor for the first two years. 
and then he walked on to Alabama and then, you know, he was an absolute rock star. And again, the film guys that I trust, like Jared Wackerly, like, you know, he, I was talking to him in, in text messages. He's like, yo, I love Jameson Williams. He's like a really, really good player. And a lot of film guys are falling in love with him. But to me, he's like, he, he's like, uh, he's, he's so tough, right? Because it's like, you know, do you make, do you make the excuse and say, ah, you know what? He was at Ohio State. It didn't work out because he sat behind Garrett Wilson and he sat behind Chris Olave and he sat behind Jackson Smith, who's an absolute God as well. And maybe there was too crowded for him. He needed to come to Alabama, but then, you know, the, the, the talented wide receiver room of Alabama, that story no longer exists because his, his only competition was John Mechie, who stinks. So um, it's a really, really tough evaluation to make. Obviously, he's very fast, right? He's got that same type of game-breaking speed. Uh, I'd say he's still better than Henry Ruggs because at least he did produce at a high level, even though it was only for one year. But it's a lot tougher for him because he's like a one-hit wonder, right? Like, Jalen Waddle was not a one-hit wonder if you actually look close enough. He was... He, he did pretty damn good. He didn't break 20%, but he was damn close in his true freshman year. And he was playing with a lot of first round wide receivers, which we knew, which I've actually proven out to be first round wide receivers. Um, but I think he is definitely an interesting case. I'm having a lot of trouble thinking about where he goes. Like, I know he definitely goes below that big group of uh, trail, you know, Drake London, who I think is, is now my new wide receiver one overall. And then you got Traylon Burks and Garrett Wilson. Uh, over there but then after those three like you know jameson williams you know rightfully so kind of enters the conversation a little bit um but he's definitely a very polarizing player i imagine none of the analysts who are going to like him but he's expected to go in the first round so again uh is is, is he a henry ruggs i don't think so because he has actually produced a, at least one year of production um but it, is he jalen waddle like no i don't i don't think so uh so it really depends on where he kind of lands in terms of cost if he's kind of floating in that you know, really late first round. Uh, I'm interested because, uh, you know, even Hollywood was, was there in that late first round. And, you know, there are players that I won't take a shot on there, but, you know, hopefully if he's like in that, if he's in that early second, then I'm definitely pulling trigger because you're getting first round draft capital uh, that late. Um, but I think he's probably the most polarizing guy in this class for me. Yeah. I would say that he's probably like, you know, somewhere in my like four to six range uh, in terms mm. of the receivers of this class. But, you know, I, uh, I, I'm very stuck on the fact that for two years he didn't do anything. But then, mm -hmm. you know, he, he is an anomaly case. And so, you know, when you're looking at analytics, you're trying to collect information on trends. You're trying to figure out, you know, what can explain most cases. But I feel like Jameson Williams is that outlier where you kind of have to throw it out the window uh, and really understand, like, why didn't he play? Was it a coaching decision? Was he just not that good? Um, I think all in all, that guy is probably going to end up getting first round draft capital. So that inherently provides a pretty uh, high floor for that player, which means that, as you pointed out, late first round uh, rookie draft capital or, you know, top of the second, that's a perfect place to take him, especially when you have, you know, a, a wide receiver draft class that's so deep, uh, you know, as, as we've seen from the testing numbers from the combine. Yeah. So moving over to the combine, I'd love to understand what you made of this really interesting combine weekend. Did you have any guys that really, really rose for you? So um, I talked a little bit about this on the my latest Mark Watch Mondays I just released, but I really do guys rise for me after the combine. I, I basically use combine as like a negative filter. So like if someone <laughs> I'm really high on and they totally botch it, I'm like, all right, well, I mean, I'm not going to be able to draft this guy high anymore because the NFL cares about the combine. Like I, I would, I would not care about the combine if the NFL didn't care about the combine, but the NFL cares about the combine and NFL drafts players. So that's the only reason why I care about the combine. And right. when it comes, especially when it comes to like wide receivers, like combine doesn't really literally, literally does not matter. Like if you look at the correlation of combine, how fast they run, how high they jump, how strong they are, yada, yada, yada. And like the actual production of wide receivers in the NFL, like it does not matter at all. There's like, there's basically zero correlation. And I think Adam Harstad put a really interesting tweet thread about this um, a little bit a while back. The reason why is because there's so many other skills required to play the wide receiver position. So if you were good enough to be very productive in college and you're good enough to get drafted, like you must be doing other things really well that make up for your lack of long speed or your lack of whatever, like Devontae Adams, not the best, not the fastest guy in the NFL, right? But he's got the best release off the line and no one can stop him, right? So that's, that's how he, he wins. DeAndre Hopkins, nowhere near the fastest guy ever, but he's got, he's got great mitts. He's got, he's a great route runner and he's great in traffic, right? So, uh, and then Keaton Allen, like not athletic at all, right? But he's a god at running routes out of the slot. So he gets a lot of reception. So there's lots of other ways that the combine doesn't measure, especially at the wide receiver position. 
uh, where like, you know, if you fail, in the con- if you don't run a fast 40, like as long as you're not going out there running like a four, nine, five, two or whatever, right? Like you're going to be fine, right? You're fast enough. Uh, so that's why like for me, like there aren't really many combine risers. The only reason why people rise in the combine is because people have fallen for me. So yep. Ky- Kyron Williams is like fell off the face of the earth because you're that small and you're slow and you're not athletic. It's like what you have to offer. I think he's a good player, but like the NFL is not going to give a shit if you're 190, you're buck 90 and, and you and you can't even break like <laughs> four six. Right. So I think he's a he's a really big faller for me, but there aren't really any big risers. I'd say like Brees Hall was already my running back one. Right. Um, I'd say maybe maybe the only the only big risers are probably some of those like fringe guys that I was looking at in that like late second. Like maybe they move up a little bit to the mid second guys like Rashad White. Right. Who have. Who have the size, who have the receiving ability, who actually tested out on the speed score pretty well. That's like pretty much the only combine thing I care about is speed score for uh for running backs. Uh, and then obviously like for all athleticism for tight ends. But you know, at the end of the day, like I'm I'm never gonna be like, oh shit, that guy ran a really fast 40. He just jumped up like six spots in my rank. That that never happens. The only way he does that is is if five guys ahead of him all shit the bed and I move all five of them down. That's the only way that happens. So I think about it in that way. I don't really think about combines as a as a positive enhancer i just think of it as a negative uh negative filter yeah that that's what affected my wide receiver one rankings because Traylon burks was the clear-cut wide receiver one for me um and you know i i agree with you like the combine all it does is really signal to you like do you fit the range of acceptable if you fall outside of that range you are effectively adding red flags to your um to your profile um so when i look at the guys that failed or uh, fell in my list i'm looking at guys like kyron williams or david bell he fell off the face of the earth um wandale he measured in you know really small and slow for his size uh and then guys like george pickens you know he um you know i I really hate the hand size you know stuff like that that stuff's kind of weird to me but Mm -hmm. you know if you're a receiver and you have big hands that one kind of feels like an easy translation and he measured at what 8.8 inch hands Mm -hmm. um which is pretty small and then you know when we're looking at these measurables i would say that the one that matters the most for wide receivers isn't the 40 speed but the 10 yard split so how fast are you in those first 10 yards that you're running because I mean, most of the time, these receivers are running within the box, right? Within those 10 yards um, from the line of scrimmage. And so George Pickens ran a pretty slow 10-yard split. Um, But when we come back to the discussion of wide receiver one, um, you said Drake London was already your wide receiver one? No, Traylon Burks was. But uh, the more I looked at it, I think the more it makes sense that Drake London kind of takes a spot for me. Not because of uh, what happened to Traylon Burks at the Combine, um, because... I was like, I mean, like, there's not going to be a DK Metcalf in every single, uh, right. in every single combine. So people that are setting up for that are setting for, for disappointment. But uh, mainly because the more I looked at like Drake London's like, like uh, experience adjusted and age adjusted metrics, it's, it's actually pretty insane just what the season that he had. Um, yeah. In terms of looking at like yards per team pass attempt, like just really really high upper echelon efficiency, uh, market share receiving yards before he got injured, obviously, and then. Obviously, the guy's like he's he's massive, right? So and the film kind of lines up as well. He played with some uh, high caliber NFL receivers in Michael Pittman and uh, Amara St. Brown, and was still able to produce. So I think everything kind of lines up for him. And I know everyone loves to jump to like the Mike Evans comparison. I don't know if he's Mike Evans or not, but he's definitely got the size and the potential to fulfill like that alpha role uh, in the NFL. So I think that's very very exciting. Um, but not a knock on Traylon Burks at all, but you know, just from the people that I've followed, they seem to think that there's a lot more weaknesses from a film perspective, uh, in Traylon Burks' game. He's a lot more limited, uh, you know, not as, not as multidimensional as a Drake London. Um, so, you know, I think those are a couple of factors going to play. So it's like, you're splitting hairs. I think they're both great prospects, but right now gun to my head, if I had to pick a wide receiver first, I think I'm just going to take Drake London off the board. That's really interesting. Um, I think that, yeah, as you, as you said, it's kind of a coin flip, you know, like you're, you're splitting hairs. For me, I, I'm i surprised to hear that feedback about Traylon Burks because from all the uh, stuff that I've read about him, he was used in all sorts of ways in the offense. You know, he was, uh, you know, uh, catching medium routes. He was running deep routes. He was used out of the backfield. He was using the slot. He was catching screens. He was blocking. So 
from what I saw, Traylon Burks was kind of used all over the field, and so that kind of made him situation-proof to me to an extent. Mm-hmm. While Drake London felt more of you know one of those long striding type uh, receivers, um, mixed in with his injury, you know coming off, I think he had an ACL injury this off season. Yeah. Um, that that kind of scares me. Now, granted, the ACL injury isn't the same thing that it was 15 years ago. Like people tear ACLs and come back and tear another one and come back and they're like you know completely fine. But mm-hmm. that you know just the fact that he's injured kind of adds a little bit more uncertainty to his profile to me. Um, that you know. It's closer than it was before the combine for me, but Drake London is still one of those guys where um, I think I'm going to have to go back and really evaluate how much did Traylon Burke's 455 40 speed really impact, you know, um, his valuation to me. Yeah, I think it, the more interesting data point for me for Traylon Burks is not his 40 time, but his like in game clock speed in miles per hour. Like we saw him hit like 20, 21 miles per hour. So I know we know that like speed is not really going to be an issue for this guy. Um, I think if you look at, uh, trail and Burks, um, he was, you're right. He was definitely used in a lot of spots, but even Drake London was used a lot of spots. I think he was getting like, he was getting like three screens a game or something like that. Mm. Uh, he was, he was basically the entire, uh, USC offense, which obviously, you know, after he, he got injured, uh, their offense took a dump. But, um, I, I think, like I said, they're both good prospects. I'd be happy to kind of grab either one. Uh, <clears throat> and I'm really kind of splitting hairs here for for drake london but just some of the feedback that i've gotten from the film perspective it seems to be a little bit more favored uh in his side obviously draft capital will come will play a role as well i'm also projecting him to go ahead of Traylon burks in the draft right now uh so that's another factor that kind of comes into play um but yeah overall uh both both pretty good prospects whichever one goes to philadelphia is going to scare me the most but you know that's that's just my my own bias right there (laughs) So, Mike, I'm curious who you feel isn't talked enough about in this 2022 class, whether those are QBs, running backs, tight ends, receivers. Um, who Who is not getting the attention they deserve? Who's not getting the attention they deserve? Honestly, I don't I don't really know if there's anyone that really stands up. Before the friggin' NFL Combine, I would have said Kyron Williams, but you know, now <laughs> we don't need to talk about him uh, at all uh, anymore because I, I have a strong – I'm – I think there's a there's a it's highly likely that he just like doesn't go until like late day three or if at all um because it was really it was really a botched a botched combine um who's not talking about enough i would say maybe wandell robinson i think wandell robinson is really interesting he's small though so you know that's gonna scare people off for sure but production wise he's a beast uh i mean and the way he's used in the offense like you said um, you know, you like how Traylon Burks kind of used like Wanda Robinson was used like all over. Uh, right. He was like that offense. So from a production perspective, if you look at his age, adjusted, uh, his experience adjusted metrics, he flies. Uh, like he's, he's, he's kind of in that upper echelon. The only thing holding back him back is the size. So obviously, you know, that could play a role. We know the NFL is evolving a little bit uh, in terms of how players are being used. Uh, you know, you're, you're getting more and more players kind of working in those hybrid roles. But obviously we saw, you know, Rondell to kind of struggle his first year as another player that I love. Um, so, you know, I think that's probably the one factor holding him back and we'll see where he goes in the draft, but if he goes to a nice creative offense, I think he could be, he could be like a pretty, pretty interesting player, um, coming out of this class that doesn't really get mentioned at all with any of the higher end wide receivers. And rightfully so he shouldn't be in the same class as Drake London or Garrett Wilson, but I do think he's a pretty interesting one that I'll be kind of looking out for in that like second round, you know, top half of the second round of my rookie drafts. The uh, situation proof uh, place that any receiver can go and their value is going to shoot up is Kyle Shanahan's offense. <laughs> um, so, you know, if we end up seeing Wandale or, or pretty much anyone shifty end up in uh, San Francisco, I think that would be, you know, a very, very ideal place to, you know, see someone like Wandale. Um, and considering that his profile tanked um, over this weekend or at the very least dropped, I could see him being at a value spot for a team. Uh, like San Francisco to go and, you know, snag him up. Yeah, I would say San Francisco. I'm not sure about that. San Francisco, they got Brandon Ayuk, who I'm still a believer in. Uh, <laughs> and then they got Debo and they got Kittle. And I mean, the assumption is Trey Lance and going to step in, you know, next year. So it'll be a pretty low passing volume offense. Uh, but maybe they, they kind of play him in like that hybrid role. But then you got Debo there. So I'm not sure if San Francisco is the best. Offer. I haven't really, I haven't played around too much with landing spots. Uh, so far this year, but I think like, you know, he could go to like, um, uh, who would be, 
a good hybrid spot for someone like a like a Wandale. Um, I mean, I think the Chiefs need a wide receiver, but they they kind of need. Uh, I think the Chiefs could work because. I mean, McCole Harmon sucks, and we all know that. I mean, <laughs> everyone's known that. I mean, I'm not everyone, but I've known that since the start, and people still love McCole Harmon. I don't know why. But, like, he could go there. He could go to, like, a Buffalo, I think, would be really interesting yep. because he's not going to be, like, your top guy, right? That That's not going to happen. So I'm looking for places where he can go where there's already an established, like, receiver that's in a decent, uh, decently high-paced uh, passing volume. Hopefully, Buffalo stays that way even after losing uh, losing Dabble. Um Wait, is his name Dabble? Did I just mess it up? Dable. Dable. Something yeah, like that. Dable. Yeah. Um, and then he can kind of go in. I'm, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not the biggest Gabriel Davis believer. I think want, like uh, someone like a Wandel could kind of go in, take over that Cole Beasley role, like become a Cole Beasley plus. I think that'd be super interesting. He's not going to be like a wide receiver one, right? But he could kind of give you that fringe, like low wide receiver two, uh, low wide receiver two type of wide receiver on a on a points per game basis, which is pretty pretty interesting. So I think like Buffalo. You know the Chiefs. I think those are those are a couple of interesting spots for someone like a Wandell to end up. I'd also be interested in how you know if he ended up in Green Bay, what would that look like? Because they don't yeah. have a wide receiver too that Rodgers really likes. But yeah. you know, at the same time, I don't know how much Rodgers would like playing with rookies. You know, like Amari yeah. Rodgers didn't really do shit. Um, yeah, well, Amari Rodgers sucks. So uh, <laughs> like that, that's the problem with the player. I mean, is Rodgers going to even be there? Who the fuck knows? I mean, I have no idea what's going to happen with Green Bay. That man Green, wants Green, his cash. Yeah, Green Bay's always needed a, a wide receiver, too. Uh, I don't know if Wandell is the guy, though. I think he's still – I guess Wandell can kind of stretch the field. So maybe he does fit. Um, but they do need – I think they need a field stretcher uh, to kind yeah. of fill that section. I've always wanted to see Will Fuller there. But, you know, Will Fuller, I don't know how much how many how many strings left he has in his hammies to kind of like yeah. keep it together. <laughs> Uh, but I love Wolf Fuller as a player, so like I always look for that type of fit uh, with yeah. an Aaron Rodgers. But Wandell could definitely be interesting there. Um, but yeah, I think those those are a couple of those are definitely a couple of interesting spots that I think he could go and kind of make a little bit of an impact right away. Uh, so I, I'm kind of keen to see where he gets drafted. I hope I hope he gets day two draft capital, like around three draft capital. I think that'd be that'd be pretty nice for him, even though he's you know he's very small. Yeah, you know, he's one of those guys where the film pops enough where it's like you're willing to overlook a lot of the other stuff. Um, yeah. And for me, that guy is Jahan Dotson in this class. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you what it like what exactly it is like his his analytics aren't like super fantastic. But it's like when you watch him on film, when you look at how he, you know, how technical he is, when you see how good his hands are, uh, Jahan Dotson is someone who I, you know, I feel like he's NFL ready. He's one of those guys where, you know, most fans won't hear about him until like week four when they pop, kind of like how Chase Claypool popped that week four, uh, where mm -hmm. he had like, you know, the 5,000 touchdowns in one game, whatever ridiculous stat line he had. Um, and, you know, like when you know when guys like this aren't really talked about i actually feel like that's really good because they will end up on those teams that can really utilize them early on like if someone like drake london or Traylon burks is probably gonna end up on the jets like eh, okay i like I, i'm not really hot about that but if Jahan dotson ends up on the rams as a wide receiver three or if he ends up in buffalo or if he hell even if he ends up in new england as like a wide receiver two like i'd be interested and you know they'd be ending up in systems where you know they're going to have their potential maximized as opposed to if you you know see them at you know in some sort of shit fuck place like uh jacksonville you know like you just don't know what's going to end up happening and you know that that player's ceiling immediately drops because you don't know what's going to happen to him yeah yeah I, i'm not that into uh i don't know if it's Jahan or johan or, or, or harvey say his name I'm not that into him uh at all he kind of uh, maybe kind of reminds me like like deshaun hamilton um mm. So, I mean, we'll see where he goes. Like you said, the numbers don't really pop for me, but also admittedly, I haven't seen much film on him. So, but he is projected to go pretty high in the draft. Um, he kind of ran pretty fast. That was his, that was a little bit of his claim to fame. We'll kind of see where he goes. Um, but for me, you know, I kind of, most of the time I just, I just focus on the top of the draft. I think, you know, someone like a Sky Moore is pretty interesting. Uh, yeah. Get, getting a lot of buzz. He would be someone that I'm, that, you know, kind of like a smaller school guy. Uh, those are always risky for wide receivers, but I think he's someone I'm willing to kind of throw a little bit of a dart on uh, later on. He's getting some buzz from the film community. I don't know how I feel about um, uh, what's what's his name, the guy that the guy that like absolutely exploded. Uh, Christian Watson. Uh, yeah, Christian Watson. So uh, my my boy Jared Wackley, like he 
he like sent me a text. He's like, yo, like take a look at this guy, like like Christian Watson. I think he I think he's a baller. Uh, and I was like, okay, I'll take a look. Like he, he went to like some shitty school though, so I don't I don't know how how good he's gonna be. <laughs> um and like production wise he's kind of like he's all right but he's not like fantastic and then he went to the combine and you know he obviously you know posted up an incredible ras score uh and he's probably one of the most athletic wide receivers there uh which probably boosts his draft stock a lot you know if he goes in the first round i'll be a lot i'll be very interested uh to see kind of where he goes in rookie drafts but if he like if he all he comes out and he's, he's athletic and he doesn't get draft capital then i'm not going to care as much but i think those are a couple of later round guys that i'm kind of really interested to see uh, where they land uh, for the most part. I think, you know, everyone thinks that Jahan Dotson is going to be a first round pick. So if he is, and you kind of already hyped up that way, I probably won't have too much of him, um, but I'm kind of more interested in, in some of these other little fringe guys here. Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. And Hey, I appreciate that context. You know, I didn't really think about the athletic score. Um, you know, the Raz score that people use a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think what we found is that all of those numbers are just noise. Like I think uh, Drew posted something a couple couple days ago where yep. he was like, "These are all the guys that had like the highest Raz scores, and like half these dudes I have never heard of, or they just yeah. didn't get drafted, or, or something like that." So um, yeah, that's it, the thing. It's like, you know, the Raz score is great. You know, it's it's a great data point, and I think I think there's something to be said about someone that is super athletic, right? And because you know it is an athletic game, but they also have to have like the production, right? If you're just super athletic and you don't have any production, it doesn't matter. Like, you know, why is Julio and Megatron, why are they so good? Like, yeah, they were freak athletes, right? So, you know, I told you that that's how they kind of won and just dominated people in the game, but they also dominated on the production front, right? And those kind of have to go hand in hand. So that's why like we say like athleticism doesn't matter. It's not that it doesn't matter. It's that like athleticism without production doesn't matter. So that's really what it comes down to for some of these players. Yeah, man. So one question that I have, uh, one last question that I have for you about the combine slash this, uh, 2022 rookie class is, you know, do you like any of the quarterbacks here? Like have, has your mind really changed? Do you feel like any of these guys, um, are hot, you know, they're worth the one oh one pick in, in rookie drafts? Uh, not yet. I mean, if McGuig Willis goes in like the top 10, like maybe kind of answers that conversation, uh, the other guys, I think they're all worth a first round rookie pick, but I don't think they're worth the 1.01. This is one of the, one of the classes where, you know, I really feel like either Drake London or, you know, maybe one of the, uh, maybe even Trevor Burks and, and maybe Brees Hall, you know, now kind of elevated himself from a draft caliber perspective. They kind of belong there. Uh, I, I don't, I don't subscribe to the notion that you have to take a quarterback in uh, 1.01 every class. Cause plenty of classes of shitty quarterbacks uh and this class feels like one that doesn't have a lot of talent at the top um that i want to take a big swing on so uh but like i said if McLean willis goes to like top five draft picks then yeah he kind of enter that conversation then it's still then it's debate it's a debate but right as of right now i'm just not sure like i'm not sure i'm not sure if the quarterback goes off the board in the first like 10 picks right now based on what i'm seeing so that's really what it comes down to for me so for the people that have followed your strategy, collect 2022 picks, don't sell yours, you know, maximize the value of, of this draft class, right? Mm-hmm. They're sitting there with, you know, one, two, three first round picks in this class. Mm-hmm. What would be your advice to them, you know, tackling this draft? Are you saying, all right, sell? Are you saying trade down? Uh, like, how do you view the totality of this class? Yeah, so I think it's going to be, normally I would say like, yeah, you can trade back, get first in the next class. You're not going to get first round picks to trade back in 2022. It's not going to happen, uh, at least in any type of like experience league. So what I would say is like, if you're going to trade back, what I would try and target is a 2024 class because that class is also pretty loaded. You know, we got a Travion Henderson. If you guys don't know who he is, look him up. He's like the next Bijan Robinson version 2.0. Uh, so if you get some picks in that class, his name alone is going to boost the value of that entire class. And I always like to look two years ahead to try and like get that, get those deals and get those discounts. So, you know, you could take like a 2022 first, get a 2024 first plus a second round pick, right? That, that could be a nice move and you get, you know, you don't get, you don't get a primo player in this class, but you will get a very high value occurring asset in 2024. And then the other part is like, I always trade out for veterans. Like, so, you know, I, you know, people that listen to my show, they know I love to dominate a class. I'll get like four or five first round picks and I'll control that class but I rarely use four or five picks. I'll, I'll, you'll be lucky to see me use like two picks out of those four or five first round picks. I'm looking to trade out for veterans. I'm looking to trade out for future picks. I'm looking to do some combo of the above, right? And 
that's what I always like to do. Like the whole point of the whole point of getting all those rookie picks for value early, early on is so you can cash them in when the draft comes, right? The worst thing you can do is own four or five, six first round picks and just pick five, six rookies because you're going to pick bus. Like it doesn't matter how good you are. You're going to pick bus. And now is the best time to acquire veterans and it's the best time to sell rookies. So, you know, a dynasty is all about understanding the calendar, understanding the ebbs and flows and timing the tops and bottoms. And now is the top of the rookie class. So, and now is the bottom of veterans. And so why not take that, take that value gap? Because when it comes in season, a lot of the rookies will bust, right? And their values decline. And you'll have, you'll, you'll be able to get this year more than ever that I can remember. You'll be able to get a lot of top end veterans that can help you win your leagues. And even if they don't help you win your leagues, it can help someone else win their leagues and their value will be much more in season, like halfway through the season. People are looking for, you know, top end wide receivers. They'll be looking for the Devonte Adams, right? That people are letting fall the third, fourth rounds. They're going to be looking for the Stefan Diggs. They're going to be looking for those types of players to help them win. So, you know, why not kind of cash in, uh, cash in, in your rookie draft to kind of just grab some of those players is it's the easiest way to flip from like rebuild to contender. Like I hate perpetual rebuilds. Like, you know, when I target a class, I tell myself like, this is the year I'm going from like, you know, you know, bottom three to top three. I want to make that shift really quickly. Uh, and the way to do it is to absolutely trade for veterans, not just, not just use rookie picks. Yeah. And I think too, like, you know, when people go and collect and uh, sometimes it, you know, Ed, you know, goes towards the end of hoarding first round picks. Mm -hmm. um, I've always contended that the whole value of having, you know, five or six first round picks is not to pick the players, but to actually have leverage and kind of strangle the draft. You control most of the board at that point. So, you know, your entire value proposition is in the fact that you have all of those picks. Mm -hmm. So you can coerce people into, you know, trading, you know, players that uh, maybe they didn't want to throw in because you're controlling controlling uh five of the first eight picks or, or or whatever your board might look like um but yeah I, I i think that all of your advice is really sound and you know if you have listened to mike today and and you felt like you know his content really speaks uh you know to how you play the game or how you want to learn how to analyze trends how to uh, you know understand the fantasy space um you should follow mike uh, where can everyone find you Oh uh, yeah, you can find me on Twitter at Mike Me Up with two P's. Uh, you can find me at uh, BDGE uh, Fantasy Football. Uh, all my content's over there now, and uh, you know I'm also you know the Bunk Bet Breakdowns channel is basically retired. We basically reconsolidated our content on, on BDGE. Uh, you can find me. I have a Patreon, Patreon.com/slash/OurPack. So on there, uh, I have a pretty close knit community of like 200, maybe 200, 300 people, um, and we talk fantasy football all the time we'll stock nfts uh you know crypto and all that type of shit too if you're into that so yeah just holler at me my dms are always open to um, try to answer questions when i can um and uh yeah man see you guys out there on the streets thanks for thanks for having me on the show uh thanks for uh reaching out i mean i'm happy to see you guys are kind of growing you guys are doing your thing uh making videos making short form making long form so it's it's good to see man I, I love to see new people kind of join the space because i think there's a you know, there's a ton of boomers in the in the in the <laughs> in the fantasy football space. So it's always good to get like new perspective, uh, new faces. It's just exciting, you know. Yeah, man. Don't use MFL. Um, that that automatically outs you. <laughs> I but, use MFL. Uh, I use MFL. Oh, okay. the, the reason why is because <laughs> there's the only way that uh, you can play Devi is on MFL. So that's that's, that's the main that's thing. True. But yeah, otherwise you don't need, really need MFL. I, I've grown to like you know, sleeper has his faults. MFL has his faults. So yep. I'm fine using either. The only one I don't want to use is is uh is fan tracks i played that for a campus of ken and i literally left the league because of that because of the for, because the platform was so trash um yeah. i couldn't handle it um and but yeah uh, that's the only platform i don't use all right well you heard it first uh if you use mfl you're not necessarily a boomer um if you're playing <laughs> if you're playing anything besides Can uh, campus to canton uh please use sleeper if you ever <laughs> want to play with me uh, thank you, Mike. Really appreciate you coming on the show. Follow him on Twitter. Follow him on Patreon. Follow him on YouTube. Follow him on the streets. Whatever you want to do. Make sure to like and subscribe th uh, to this channel. And uh, we'll catch you next time. Let's hit that music. <laughs>